in the book of 1 John, chapter 4, verse 8, it tells us that God is love. And I don't know that anyone in here would deny that God is love. This preacher certainly would never deny that God is love. Not only does it state it that emphatically in 1 John 4, 8, but Romans 5, 8 even explains if we ever were to question that God is love, Paul wrote in Romans 5, 8, God showed his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That kind of closes the deal, doesn't it? Yeah, but this happened in my life or that happened in my life. Yeah, but when you didn't deserve it and you were a sinner and no guarantee that you would accept the sacrifice even if Christ went through the humiliation and pain, Christ died for you. So God is love. I'm just going to lay that out as an established fact. Assume no one wants to argue the point and move on. But we have to be careful as Christians. We're all about loving people and helping out the local elementary schools and feeding people on Wednesday nights and doing all these things. We pray and pray and pray for people when they bring us their prayer requests. Because God is love. And because we want to show God's love, reflect God's love, back out into our church and back out into the community. But we have to be careful. And sometimes we want so hard to show the world how nice we are and how loving God is that we can polish a little bit of an edge off of him that shouldn't be. God is love. God is perfect love. But God is also infinitely holy and perfectly righteous. And sometimes that puts a different spin on God than we might want to have put on God. We started last week in the Psalms. I said we would go four weeks. Today we're going to talk about God's infinite holiness and his perfect righteousness and where that leads to how God stands, where God stands on sin. Because again, while I want to paint God as love, and while I can absolutely assure you he is, because Jesus Christ died for you when you were still a sinner, that's love. That's unmerited mercy and grace, all flowing from love. He's not a giant Santa Claus in the sky or some big pot-bellied grandfather who just overlooks whatever the grandkids do. That's not God. And we don't want to paint God that way. And so we're going to read in the Psalms this morning, and we're going to try to paint an accurate, balanced picture of Almighty God. Let's start with Psalm 99. It talks about God's holiness and his righteousness. The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. The king in his might loves justice. You have established equity, the psalmist tells God. You have executed justice and, justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool. Here we go again. Holy is he. Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Samuel also was among those who called upon his name. They called to the Lord and he answered them. In the pillar of the cloud, he spoke to them. They kept his testimonies and the statute that he gave them. O oh Lord our God, you answered them. You were a forgiving God to them. But an avenger of their wrongdoings. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain, for the Lord our God is holy. That's the psalm I thought that had God is holy the most in it, so that's the one I went with this morning. I could have gone with a number of others. God is love, no doubt. But God is also holy. God is holy in a way that we can't even understand holy. God is perfect and he is righteous and his righteousness and his justice are infinite, just like everything else about God is infinite. 
beyond what we can understand. And when we have to be careful when we paint a picture of a loving father, it is 100% accurate. But if we don't remind ourselves of the other dimensions of God, his infinite holiness and his infinite righteousness and his desire to have infinite justice, we mispaint the picture of the God that we worship. I heard a preacher say one time, a real preacher, not somebody like me. I heard a preacher say one time, you know, if you get a little mud on your clothes, depending on the circumstance, you don't really like it. Now, yesterday when we went to work, and I'm sure some of the guys noticed this, but I wore an old shirt that was dirty and stained so that at the end of the day, even if I hadn't done any work, it would look like I had done work when we took a when we took pictures at the end of the day, you know, I'd be all dirty and grungy like everybody else and at least get partial credit. So when you go to spread out mulch and pine straw, you sort of assume there's going to be a little mud on your clothes, and really it doesn't bother you. If you're dressed in your normal everyday clothes and you get mud splashed on it, it's much more offensive. And this preacher said, God is like the bride who's prepared for 25 years for her wedding. And who got daddy to pony up $2,000 for a pure white wedding dress. And if somebody drives by and splashes mud on that thing, the bride is offended. A little bit of mud on my work clothes, not so bad. A little bit of mud on this suit, I'm not very happy. A little bit of mud on a $2,000 pure white wedding dress five minutes before you have the ceremony you've waited your entire life for is just unacceptable. And he said, that's the way God is. God walks around in a multi-thousand dollar wedding dress every day and one small stain is insanely offensive to him. And it may not bother you. One little white lie, being late for something that you promised somebody you would be on time to help them with, that may not bother you much. Because in your mind, you're in your work clothes that day for that lie, for that theft, for that whatever. (laughs) But God is enthroned. This is a horrible picture to paint. God is enthroned in his white, pure wedding dress every second of eternity. And so any small stain to him is this incredibly offensive stain. I'm not trying to erase the fact that God is love. I'm not trying to do that at all. I'm just trying to make... God's holiness and righteousness equal to God's love. That's all I'm trying to do. We talked about when we went through the Psalms that the Psalms are essentially a prayer book or a hymn book. They deal a lot with human emotions. And the Psalms tell us it's okay to go to God and complain. I'm tired of being sick. I'm tired of being poor. It's okay to go to God and say, um, I'm fearful. I'm anxious. Can you remind me how you hold me in your hand? It's certainly okay to go to God, and the Psalms is full of this. Go to God with praise and shouts of joy. The Psalms talk about if you're happy, then play music. And if that ain't good enough, play loud music. And if that ain't good enough, add another instrument and hit the drums louder and crash the cymbals even harder, God says, until the volume of the instruments and the volume of your voice match the intensity of the passion in your heart for how awesome you think God is for the blessings that he's given you for whatever it is that you started praising him for to begin with. And that's kind of what the Psalms are about. It's about our human emotions. And how we can go from, I almost wish I had never been born right now, to a week later, I want to praise God and I want the whole band to back me up while I do it. But the Psalms also are about God. You can't write a book of the Bible, Psalms or anything else, that just talks about humans and our take on it, though the Psalms do without writing a book of the Bible that talks about God. And so when I knew I was going to spend four weeks in the Psalms, we started off last week with Psalm 1. We used it as an introduction. And I knew the second week I had to talk about what the Psalms say about God. The next two weeks, we'll get back to what the Psalms say about us. But let's see what the Psalms say about God. Because God's holiness... And his righteousness come through in the Psalms very clearly. And not only his holiness and his righteousness, but his hate for wickedness. 
the fact that God despises sin comes through in the Psalms. Psalm 45, verse 6 and 7, do a nice little job of summing this up. And the psalmist here is talking about Jesus. Now, Jesus hadn't hit the scene yet, but the psalmist is talking about Jesus. And it goes on in this psalm, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it goes on in the psalm to say, this is why you will be anointed above anybody else that's ever represented God. And this is what the psalmist says. This is why Jesus got anointed. Anointed, it means he's the Messiah, he's the Christ. This is why he's the Messiah or the Christ. The psalmist says, your throne, O God, yes, Jesus is God, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of uprightness. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. The very next word in that psalm is therefore. Therefore, God, your God, in other words, therefore, God the Son, God the Father, will anoint you above everybody else. What's one of the criteria? you got to love righteousness. you got to be in your white wedding dress. If you're going to be God's anointed king on earth, you got to love righteousness and holiness. And what's the counter to that? you got to hate wickedness. But hold on, I can go even further. Because there's a couple of psalms that just pour it on. Psalm 5. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my groaning. Give attention to the sound of my cry, my King and my God. For to you do I pray. I've said those exact same words a million times. O Lord, in the morning you hear my voice. In the morning I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. Hold on. Does it say it on the screen like it says it in my Bible? You hate all evil doers. Black and white, God's word. No, God is love. I'm not denying that. I'm not denying God is love. There it is. Psalm 5, verse 5. You hate all evil doers. You destroy those who speak lies. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. I don't use big words like that, but it really means he hates them with a passion. You hate with a passion the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. But I, through the abundance of your steadfast love, there it is. See, the psalmist agrees. God is love. But I, through the abundance of your steadfast love, will enter your house. I will bow down towards your holy temple in the fear of you. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before me. For there is no truth in their mouth. Their inmost self is destruction. Their throat is an open grave. They flatter with their tongue. Make them bear their guilt, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels because of the abundance of their transgressions Cast them out, for they have rebelled against you. Man, the psalmist is fed up with people who aren't glorifying God the way that they ought to be glorifying God. And he's saying, look, God, I am trying to defend your cause here on earth. I am trying to spread your fame to all the nations, as the psalms also tell us to do. And I got people over here that are getting in the way. And you know what? They don't care that they're getting in the way. And I'm just kind of praying to you to take them out. For your name's sake, get rid of them. But let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them ever sing for joy and spread your protection over them that those who love your name may exult in you. For you bless the righteous, O Lord. You cover them with favor as with a shield. Now, I'm not going to deny to you, we talked about this a few months ago, The Psalms are written as poetry. And you have to be careful when you read poetry because it says things like Andy's love for his wife is as deep as the ocean or as high as the mountains. 
right? And you can't really quite make that into exact line. So that so his I don't have no have any idea how deep the deepest ocean is, but so you're saying Andy's love for his wife is exactly 2.8 miles deep because that's the deepest ocean. No, it's not quite. You can't quite do it that way. So I understand the language of the Psalms is poetry, and I understand we're to interpret it as that. And sometimes in poetry you write things like. I hate myself when I've done blah, 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 and I love myself. And, and you don't maybe quite mean hate and love, but without splitting hairs and getting into the semantics here, the Psalms say in more than one place, and I'm going to read you another one here in just a second, the Psalms say in more than one place that God is love and that he does, in fact, love righteousness. And if you fear him and you come back to him, it doesn't matter what you've done to who in the past, it can all be taken away and erased. But if you don't, if you are wicked because you want to be wicked and you know God's asked you not to be wicked and some preacher has stood up and told you how holy God is and that you need to revere and respect his holiness and you don't do it, you can nitpick, yeah, but that's poetic language, Andy. It doesn't exactly mean he hates the evildoer. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. I'm acknowledging it's poetic language. I'm acknowledging that. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. I don't want this church or the modern Christian church to dumb down God. God is infinitely holy and God is infinitely righteous. And God hates sin. And he cannot be, the psalmist said, in the presence of evil. And sometimes that's not the God that we preach. We're so interested in bringing the unsaved into the doors and getting them baptized that we think if we preach a Santa Claus God, it'll further our cause. But it doesn't. Because if all we do is create a bunch of Santa Claus Christians... We're not biblical. I don't want you to misunderstand. I'm going to wrap this up in a second. I'm not at all trying to say that God will not forgive you of your sins. In fact, 90% of what I preach from this spot is that God is more than willing to forgive you of your sins. God is eager to forgive you of your sins. The Bible says, Jesus himself said, the only time we throw a party in heaven is when somebody repents of their sins because that means God gets to forgive them through my blood, the blood of Jesus Christ, and we have a banquet. And it doesn't matter what all the righteous people do. doesn't matter what all the saved people do, Jesus said. We ain't going to throw a party over it. But we break out the finger sandwiches. And Joanne Atkinson's little, uh, what is it, watercress nuts wrapped in bacon? Greatest hors d'oeuvre ever. Jesus says, we break out the watercress nuts wrapped in bacon when somebody repents because it means God gets to forgive one more <coughs> of his creation. It means the blood of Christ painfully shed gets to cover one more sinner and save him from hell. If you're going to die on a cross in humiliation and pain, wouldn't you at least want some folks to take advantage of it? Nobody wants to die in vain. Nobody. Certainly not the king of the world. So Jesus is like, God is more than willing to forgive you. But don't think you can play this game. I want to kind of live like I want to live and kind of do the things I want to do and mess up a little bit, come in here and get my free pass with communion and then live a little bit like I want to live and keep my bad habits going and then add to it another bad habit because when I get to heaven at judgment day, God is love. God is love. And I just think the psalmists tell us that's a mistake. That's a mistake. Psalm 11. In the Lord I take refuge. How can you say to my soul, flee like a bird to your mountain, for behold, the wicked bend the bow. They have fitted their arrow to the string to shoot in the dark at the upright in heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? 
The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes see, his eyelids test the children of man. The Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who does violence. God is love. God is love. And he tests the righteous. And his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. So now the psalmist says, well, if God hates those people who are intentionally sinning and harming others, what should we do? Let him rain coals on the wicked, the psalmist says. Fire and sulfur and a scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. Why, if God is love, why would he rain coals and hellfire on people? For the Lord is righteous. That's why. Infinite righteousness, infinite justice requires an infinite punishment. We don't think like that. There are proverbs that say it is just as offensive to God to let a guilty person go free as to accuse an innocent person and condemn them. And we don't think like that. We think God just wants to give everybody a free pass because God is love. The Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Let him bring coals on the wicked, fire and sulfur, and a scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds, and the upright shall behold his face. What's my point? I don't have one. No, I'm just kidding. What's my point? Here's my point. It's basically all up to you. God is love. There is not a sin listed other than blaspheming the Holy Spirit, which I can assure you none of you have done lately. There's not a sin listed that the Bible says God won't forgive. So it doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter who you've been or who you've hung around or the things that you've done. Don't misunderstand this sermon, please. I am not telling you that if you are a disgusting sinner, a murderer and a thief and a rapist and a con artist, even an Auburn fan, it just kind of fits in there with those things, doesn't it? Any Auburn grads? Diane Allen's not here, so I'm picking on Auburn. Even an Auburn fan, God can forgive. God actually wants to forgive. But guys, I'm just telling you, the Bible tells us, and the Psalms is one of the places where it is most clear. God's not going to be fooled, and God's not going to be taken advantage of, and God's not going to be conned. It's as simple as this. The psalmist, every one of them, when they write, God hates wickedness and God hates sin and God hates the evildoer, they immediately flip, don't they? They can't stand for the balance to be out of balance. They immediately flip and say, but those who turn to the Lord will receive his favor. The one psalm said they'll even receive sort of a hedge of protection around their life. For those who turn to the Lord, the nasty, disgusting things they did don't matter anymore. There's another psalm that says God forgives our transgressions and separates them as far as the east is from the west. They're infinitely separated from us when we turn to God. I just want to make sure that this church doesn't paint a picture of a God that says, do what you want with your earthly life. And when you stand before me in judgment, you can count on my love. It's all up to you. You can count on God's love right now, no doubt. But preacher, you don't know, man, I've done this and that. I don't care. I don't care. I have no doubt there will be mafia bosses in heaven. There will be drug lords in heaven. I have no doubt. At some point, the Holy Spirit has knocked on their heart and they've realized what they've done and they've turned back to God and said, you love righteousness and your greatest desire is to make me as righteous as your son by just covering me in his blood. And that is God's greatest desire, that I be transformed into the image of Christ. And if I come to God humbly, pathetically, and just say, I'm not there, I ain't going to get there, 
I've done horrible things. And even if I turn towards you, I'm still going to mess up. God says, that's all right. You come to me. I'll give you the power of the Holy Spirit to help. I'll give you the righteousness of my son. And all of a sudden, everything is different. All that God hates wickedness and God's going to rain hellfire on the evildoers is no longer a part of who you are and who you have to be. I say this all the time because I love it. The Bible says we have eternal life through Jesus Christ. That's my favorite thing to say from the platform. We have, if you've accepted Christ and been baptized, John doesn't say then you will get eternal life when you go to heaven. John is emphatic. You have it now. My eternal life is guaranteed right now. But let me tell you why. Because I know God hated evildoers. And instead of me trying to slip through this life, doing as little as I can to get by, and then getting there and throwing myself on the mercy of the court, I went to God and said, I know what I've done is wrong. And I need your help to stop it, but I really, really need your help to cover it up. So God, if I tell you it was wrong and you can read my heart, you know I believe it was wrong. Can we do away with all that hellfire and sulfur stuff? Not because I'm afraid of the hellfire and the sulfur, God, but because I love you and I've come to realize your way is best. If I come to you honestly, God, and tell you I believe Jesus is who he says he is and did what he said he did, and I come to you and honestly say, I've messed up, and I'm not going to try to play off your love. I'm going to accept it, and I'm going to revel in it, but I'm not going to try to con you over it. If I do that, God says, oh yeah, if you turn back toward me and you fear me in your heart, you respect me, you have the appropriate reverence for my holiness in your heart, then you're one of the righteous and your life is different and your salvation is guaranteed. Guys, this church preaches God is love. But this church also preaches God is perfectly holy and perfectly righteous and cannot and will not bear to be in the presence of sin. So unless your sin has been covered by Jesus Christ through a humble submission to his lordship, through repentance and baptism, God hates all evildoers. Let me pray. God, we thank you for your word. The power of the Psalms is just amazing. It gives us the right to come to you in prayer, to complain and to pray for help and to thank you and to praise you and to try to lay our anxieties and our burdens on you, Father. But it also shows us, God, your ultimate passion and wisdom and holiness. We pray, God, that our hearts and our minds have an accurate picture of the awesome, infinite God that we serve. And God, let your holiness and your awesomeness and your infiniteness bring us to you on our knees, crying for Jesus Christ. God, I thank you for all that you do. I love you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. If someone has a prayer request this morning or a decision that they would like to make, um, I'll be down front while we sing the invitation hymn. Thank you. in Jesus just to take him at his word just to rest upon